behind the king did fall Floating all beneath it when you look at the devastation that was once a rural community, it is hard to imagine that there were 500 homes washed away in what appears to be now an endless mud flat. It's hard to imagine that a wall of cold slurry water rampaged down this hollow in a matter of minutes on a Saturday morning. A late winter warm spell thawed the snowpack, then came two days of heavy rains. Two days before the dam burst, roads were closed due to high water in the area, and still the rains came. Then that slag dam that impounded the coal waste at the top of the hollow just came apart. Did anyone think it would ever happen? A survivor was asked that two days after the disaster. I've been thinking that for years, ever since they backed that water up in there. They backed it up there with slate. And I figured if it ever got up far enough to come over the top of it, just the least bit of it, I'd just keep eating down and went on out. Your family got out all right? Though. I just, I don't know, I just wasn't, didn't have enough get up about me to move on out of this hall. The warnings came neighbor to neighbor after radio station WVOW broadcast the word that the dam had burst. One listener told announcer Marty Backus he heard the broadcast in time to move his family to higher ground. He said that he was listening to WVOW radio and that they received their warning about 30 minutes before the water came gushing through and they had time enough to take the family car and his seven children and wife up to a higher elevations. He said his house was moved approximately 100 to 150 feet and uh, it was completely demolished. I was at home. Uh, my mother was a, uh, a postmaster at Ackerville and she did not drive. It was a Saturday morning, she had to work. So I, as any young person did at that time, I had the radio on listening to the music and the news came on, it was the Logan Station. And the Logan Station said that uh, the uh, creek was flooding, we knew that. But the, then the Logan station said that there was, a, that the dam had burst up the head of the holler and that people should be moving to higher ground. So I was my mother's designated driver that morning. So I went in to where she was in the kitchen and, and told her, I said, Mom, uh, they just had a report on the radio that the dam has burst up the head of the holler. And she said, well, we need to get over and save the stuff at the post office <laughs> uh, because you know, she really was worried about oh. if the post office were flooded, mm -hmm. what would she do? How could she get the mail service out to people? So we got in the car and we went off the hill and down in the little valley there to Ackville where the post office used to be. And uh, we were putting, we went in, we started taking all the uh, important things, mm -hmm. the stamps, the money, anything that was not bolted down, we took and put into the trunk of our, of, uh, our vehicle. And about that time, as I was putting some things in the trunk, she was handing them to me, I was putting them in the trunk. Uh, the police came by the county deputy, it was Max Doty, uh, who, ha who happens to be my next door neighbor now, his wife does. So uh, he, he said, uh, you need to get up to higher ground. The dam has burst up the, the head of the holler. And I told him, I said, we will as soon as we get the rest of the uh, paraphernalia out of the post office. So we did that and uh, we went back up on, up on Ackerville Flat where we lived. We lived in one of the front houses of the uh, uh, flats mm -hmm. and we watched the uh, water come down. All the people who lived on the hill, there were several people who came up on the hill to 
escape into safety. And we, uh, we watched the waters come down. The first thing we saw was up at Ruffner, uh, the straight stretch at Bray Home, uh, we saw the transformers just, you know, so everyone got, oh no, is this going to make our houses burn down? So everyone ran to their house and, and pulled the breakers on, on, on their fuse boxes. And then we came back down and we just watched the, the water come down. We watched trailers floating down and being uh, jammed up against bridges at Low Ash and take the bridge out. A house float down. Mm -hmm. uh, so we watched it uh, happen. We were kind of worried because one of my brothers uh, worked at the place where yeah. it was flooding. So we were kind of worried. So the electricity went off, we had no water, we had some guests at our house, which was fine with us, you know, because we were welcome to take anyone in uh, who, who needed help. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, uh, about 11 o'clock that day, you know, we had no electricity, we had no water, and we were seeing, you know, it was devastation. Uh, and my brother, who had worked in the mines, he came down. And he said um, uh, what he had seen, and uh, he said, uh, can anyone take me home? Because he lived there. So I uh, took my brother home. There We dodged uh, cars and other pieces of metal and, and parts of houses as we went down the road, mm -hmm. uh, Kistler, and, and uh, we got into man. There was a lot of mud in man, but we, I went to uh, Mallory, where he lived, took him home. His wife was very happy to see him. And I stopped at the supermarket on the way back and got some groceries. <laughs> uh, so it was about uh, 2 o'clock when I uh, uh, started coming uh, back toward Man, and I got to where the stoplight is at Man, And there were deputies there. They weren't letting people back up the hollow. Yeah. Well, fortunately, my brother-in-law, was one of the deputies, and I said, Burhead, I've just taken Melvin home, uh, please let me go back. So he let me through, so I made it back home, and uh, we, since we lived on the hill, we had no damage, but uh, we we were there. Uh, we saw the devastation. Uh, we worked the, well, my mother worked the canteen uh, for the Salvation Army mm -hmm. and the Red Cross, so, and I helped her with that. Oh, that's and, uh, interesting. Uh, because they had a, there were people had no food. Yeah. You know, they had no place to go, and so uh, my, uh, uh, we worked there at Ackerville, where the where the post office used to be. It was gone. Mm -hmm. She got a commendation for saving the post office. <laughs> This is the 41st anniversary of the Buffalo Creek Flood, and I have here with me my grandmother, Sherry Ann Berge Burgess Atkins, and her husband, Edison Atkins, who were both living on Buffalo Creek at the time of the tragedy. They have both agreed to give a brief interview about their perspective of the flood. What can you tell me about the morning of February 26, 1972? Well, it was around 8.30 that morning, and it was a Saturday morning, and I always had to go to the laundromat on Saturdays. And your pawpaw, who is now deceased, had went to his mother's house. And while I was getting ready, and I had took your father up to my mom's. He was uh, 15 months old at the time. And your pawpaw came driving up the road real fast, yelling for all of us to go to the slate dump that the dam had broke. And my mom, I still had small uh, brothers and sisters at home. My mom got all the kids and um, I got your dad and we all went up on the slate dump out from our house. And uh, by the time we got there, um, we could see the black water. And we saw mobile homes, we saw our neighbors' homes being washed away, and it was just a horrible sight. It had rained for days, and um, 
it was real cold that day and it was snowing a little bit and we just stood there and watched that's all we that's all we could do was just watch and feel helpless because there was nothing we could do how old were you at the time uh, I was 17 okay Edison what can you tell me about the morning of the flood on the day of the flood, uh, my mom worked at a, at a store called Goodman's Grocery, and the deputy sheriff had come down the road blowing his horn and telling them that the dam had broke, and she got in the car, and at that time, I lived at Crown, which is about three miles farther down the road than your mother, your grandmother lives. And mom come home and told us that the dam had broke, and being curious like we was, we all walked down to the railroad track and was watching along the creek banks and we seen all this black water coming down the creek and as we walked down the track we got down to the bridge of Crown and all this black water and wood and tin and uh, just started piling up and the water started backing up in the community and we was watching the water as it backed up and the, we looked and the water started going around both sides of the bridge and all at once we looked and there was a trailer coming down the middle of the creek. And as this trailer came down, it hit the bridge and tore the bridge out and then all the water started going down. And we all just kind of thought, wow, you know, that was something. We didn't realize that there were people in this water and all the devastation that it had done up the creek. So we started walking up the, the railroad track and I can remember just how cold and wet and just that eerie feeling that we all had, wondering just what in the world was going on. So as we walked up the track, in Crown, we walked by a church that belonged to Lance Caserta and his congregation. And there was an elderly man that was caught in part of a fence line there that had stripped all the clothes off of him. And we was just amazed to think of how they had done that. But as we walked on up the hollow, in some areas in Low Ash and Ackerville, where the water had backed up, I can remember the trailers were just floating around and people were just standing there watching and we was all, I, just a mild shock, I guess, is what you could say. But my biggest memory was Dave was, uh, just to talk to that man being in there and then come to find out they had found a little girl uh, uh, in part of the fence line there too and that just devastated me and I but that particular day uh, just the, the snow and the rain and how cold it was and as I walked on up the road uh, at all the bridges and the trussels I seen, remember seeing all the wood the buildings that had hit the bridge and tore them up and the wood were just stacked on top of each other. And where you could see where the water had went around and just wiped whole communities out. And uh, that particular day, just as I got home, we got home and we didn't think about, we didn't have no power. We didn't have no way to go anywhere because all the bridges were gone. And uh, I can just remember just how cold and wet it was that day and that night. But uh, that's my main thought on the first day of the flood. How old were you at the time? I was 21 and uh, I was staying home with mom. I had been in Cleveland working and I had just come home and recently got a job in the coal mines. And that's something else that once uh, the next day or two after the flood, we had to make arrangements to try to get back and forth to work. And I can remember having to get permission to go up on top of Kelly and go to work and then have a permit to get back in to get home. And that's another thing that I can remember about the flood. I had to, I had to walk a mile every morning just to catch a ride to work. And, uh, but I was a whole lot luckier than a lot of other people was during that period of time. How did you find out that the dam had broken?
the way I found out was when your papa came driving up the road um, when he left his mother's and drove up the road um, to come and get me to take me to the laundromat, he saw the wall of water coming around the curve um, up there where the carryout is now at Robinette. And he hurried and got all of us and took us up to the slate dump. Like I think I said earlier, was my mom was working at Goodman's Grocery at that time, and Deputy Sheriff by the name of Max Doty, which was my uncle's brother, was coming down the creek and blowing his horn and telling everybody to get to higher ground that the dam had broke. And my mom come home scared to death. She come in and grabbed us kids and told us, Lord, the young, the kids, the, the, the dam had broke. And, you know, not being able to comprehend something like that, it just we just couldn't believe that that had happened. Uh, you mentioned that you saw the black water uh, coming down the creek. Um and everything about the people, you know, the man being stripped and everything because of the water pressure. Uh, but what exactly did you see or hear? Uh, did you see houses or trailers, you know, coming down? Uh, did you hear screams and cries and, you know, what what well, did you see? What, well, we live that day down in the Crown, uh, if you will. The people were standing on the tracks. And we was watching the water race down the creek and where it had washed the houses off, all this wood and debris just started damming up against the bridge and the water started backing up and people above us were screaming that the houses above us was starting to pick up off their foundations and like I said, the only thing that saved Crown at that particular time was a big trailer come right down the middle of the creek and took the bridge out and it just like it opened up like a draw bridge. And then, I don't know if people can remember exactly, but the way this flood happened is like it went from one bridge to another bridge to a trussle, and that's where all this debris piled up at. But the only screaming and hollering I heard of day was that uh, people were just oohing and on because they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. And as I went on up the track, uh, the track like I told you, I seen trailers floating around and people, you know, was just uh, just talking who that belonged to or what that belonged to or certain so-and-so's house had washed off. But the, where I lived at, if you will, they we were farther down the creek and we had more time to prepare uh, and get people to safety than we did, uh, as people did further up the creek. Like your grandmother and my grandma here were just, what, three or four miles from where the dam had broke. Well, the only thing that saved us on, on this side of the road was the water came down Main Robinette and the creek was over on the other side of, of where we live and we saw houses washed off their foundations, trailers, and uh, the water all, and the debris backed up uh, behind the railroad trestle across the, the road from us and it kept building up and building up and if the it finally broke the trestle and let everything flow on down or it it would have come over our way and probably it wouldn't have affected where I live because I live farther up but it could have affected my aunt and uncles that lived closer down to the railroad track but it just seemed like the water went from one side to the other because of the bridges and the railroad trestles. What kind of thoughts were running through your mind as you were observing all of these tragic events? It was just unbelievable. It's just hard to visualize it. All that black water coming out there and all that debris. And, and at that particular time, you just didn't think of all the devastation that it done. But, like I said, as I walked up the track, and I've seen homes and trailers missing, and, uh, and especially around Ruffner and Bray Home, and uh, especially up around Beko. That's when it really hit me that uh, the devastation of how much damage that it had done, and the people that was involved, not 
not realizing that he had killed that many people. Well, as I watched the water from uh, standing on the slate dump, I had no idea that people were dying at that time. All I could think about was the homes that were that were washing away and um, just all the damage that was being done. I I just didn't realize, I guess because I was so young, I didn't realize that people were dead, people were dying as all that was happening. I didn't realize it until later on. We were luckier than a lot of people because by the time it got this far, most of the damage, you know, well, the worst damage had been done. On up the creek, I mean, there was just nothing left. What can you tell me about the night of the flood after it had happened? Uh, where did you stay? Uh, was it cold and dark? You know, just anything you can tell me about that night after the flood had happened? Well, to begin with, I didn't realize at that particular time we was walking back to home and not realizing that we didn't have no power, no telephone, no communications. And, uh, all we done was, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, uh, just going, we went to bed that night and thinking of just uh, no power, no, no groceries, no nothing, you know. We had no communications. And uh, like I said, it was just so wet and cold and uh, just the thoughts of, you know, that was something else too, that we didn't know how all our family members were either. But yet, uh, that night was just, that was just a cold, wet night. For me, what I remember is just the darkness and how quiet it was. You could step out on your porch and where there used to be street lights, porch lights, you could hear traffic go by, there was nothing, no sound. Just complete darkness and cold. We were fortunate enough where we had a gas well on our property to have heat. And, uh, but other people weren't that fortunate. Did you lose any loved ones during this tragedy? Uh... Were you or anyone in your family affected by the loss of a loved one? Uh, my uncle, who lived in Maryland, they were able to see all the footage from the news footage. And um, he came home, and he had a hard time getting on Buffalo Creek. His mother and father and sister lived at Lundell, and he lost all three of them um, in the flood. And my uncle and aunt that lived right out from me, he lost a brother and a sister-in-law who lived up at Lundell. And um, my cousin's wife lost her sister in the flood. Before I married your grandmother, I was married to another lady by the name of Vicki Gerald. And she had lost her mom, her dad, her aunt and two cousins in the flood. And that's, that's all I think as far as the family goes, Dave. So. Was uh, anybody in your family, uh, did they lose any of their property or uh, anything valuable to them? My grandmother and grandfather lived at Amherstel at the time and they lost their home, everything that they had. It was bad. So you say uh, communication was a problem? Yes, yeah, we, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, truthfully, uh, like, like your grandmother said, uh, there was no cars on the road, there was no telephone communication. And remember, this was back in the 70s, and the telephone was about all we had back in those days. So it was just a uh, word of mouth. Uh, if somebody told you certain so and so, you know what I'm saying. And it was like a week or so before uh, I even got lined out enough to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So it was some terrible times. And you had to have. Um, they started. I don't remember how long after the flood, even to get out of Buffalo Creek to go to the, to a store. Uh, they had guards 
and you had to have a pass showing that you were a resident of Buffalo Creek and you had to show that pass to get out of Buffalo Creek and then to come back in to Buffalo Creek to get back home if you needed to go to the grocery store because all the stores up through here had been damaged they weren't able to restock their supplies and it was just it was hard to go anywhere how did you react or respond uh, to this tragedy? Well, myself, like I said, it just, uh, the day of the flood, the, the, the more I walked up the railroad track and looked over into the communities, the farther up the road I went. And like I said, uh, uh, it was cold and gloomy that day. And just seeing, I know a lot of people on this creek, and just seeing the devastation that I seen, just absolutely it's in my brain today uh, but I still didn't realize that the amount of people that had, had died that day and after all it was over with it still amazes me that that water done that much damage it's something that we'll never forget and we've I've tried to explain to your dad um, the way things used to be on Buffalo Creek and he only remembers it the way it is now. But it's just something that, that the ones of us that were here that experienced it will we'll never forget. Do you believe there was a purpose for the flood, uh, for all the tragic events that happened? If so, what purpose do you believe it held? A lot of people call it an act of God, but I don't, I don't think that. I don't believe that. No. What I've read is man caused that. Uh, everything I've read on the Buffalo Creek flood, but we didn't know it at that time though. Like I said, it just, people just kept crying wolf and saying the dam's going to break and, and eventually it did. That's That was the problem. But now, there's one thing I want to say, that, that this happened on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. If this would have happened on a school day, this could have been ten times worse yes. than what it was. Because it was about the time the, that all the little kids would have been out at the bus stops ready to catch the bus. So that's one, you know, that's one thing that was... Well, not only that, but you had the coal miners going to yeah. work. It was a Saturday, a lot of miners didn't work on Saturday. Right. So. And then there was a lot of people up the road that probably never knew what hit them. They, they, they were probably still in bed asleep and never did even wake up. Has your life changed since the morning of February 26, 1972? If so, how? The only thing I can say that's changed for me really is, is uh, I always lived in the lower part of the Buffalo Creek area and I always said that I would never live above Crown and I've lived in Johnson Hotch and robbing it for the last 30 some years, so I lied on that part. <laughs> so, <laughs> because, uh, truthfully, uh, after the flood, uh, building the new road and the houses, and the, uh, it changed everything here on Buffalo Creek. And it, it changed my way of thinking, too. And uh, right now, it's just, I think everybody's still healing from the uh, I think it's something that none of us will ever forget. The ones of us that were here that saw the devastation and experienced it. But uh, as for me, I, I didn't lose anything, any, didn't have any damage to a home or anything. And I've lived right here in this same area on this family property for 58 years. And, I guess this is where I live till I die. But like Eddie said, you know, it's something we're never going to forget. Um, and there are people that were directly affected um, by the flood that that will be damaged from now on. They'll they'll just never never get over it. But things will never be the same as they were back then.
Okay. In your own words, tell me what happened on February 26, 1972. Well, the night before, I think it was Jack Kent that went up through there and advised people to get out because they really suspected the dam was going to break. That's why they had someone up there with the bulldozer trying to divert the water or something that was doing the damage already. So, some folks from Three Forks had already come down. Because as I thought, and they thought also, that if, if the dam was to break, some might be able to, to get in their cars and, and go out if it was to break. Because we lived within eyesight of the dam. I knew what that dam held. Because at that time, before that, my mother and daddy rode a motorboat on that big, that first dam, because now that was a big one. And several people, you know, came to, to ride the motorboat on the dam. And they knew the what was behind it, and there was a bridge that led out at the creek went under, and the creek was to its banks. And they knew if the dam broke, there was no possible way that anybody could ever get across that bridge because the water would be over it. So uh, those folks came from uh, Three Forks. And they were over at the grade school. I went over to my mother and daddy's, which was just right across the little walkway. And uh, those people were coming from Three Forks. So I was cooking breakfast the morning of the 26th. And the screaming and all that stuff Billy Aldridge was the one that came down through there telling that the dam was break, was breaking or it had broke. Had broke. Had broke. Of course, it was around uh, 8 o'clock, and I was frying bacon when I heard all that. I went to the front door and looked out, and the black water was halfway up that mountain. It's a truth, halfway up that mountain. Because the creek couldn't hold any more water. It had, it was up to the banks of the, uh, the water was. And that car that was on that was, was bouncing up and down. The water was throwing it. Well, then I knew that what, what was really going on, that the dam had broke. So from then on, it was just chaos. I mean, just people coming and going and crying and screaming and all that. And that's my memories of the morning, the evening of the 25th and the morning of the 26th when the dam did break. Of course, I was petrified because I knew what was behind two dams. I, I never did see the third dam. I saw the two. And I knew what was behind that, and that was enough to destroy half of Buffalo Creek anyway. So that's what I remember of that morning. Okay. How did you find out that the dam had broken? Well, uh, Billy Aldridge's one was tilted that came down through there, and, and the water, he, he made the comment to his wife that, he was driving down the road just as fast as he could go, and looking out his back uh, car window, he could see the water following him. So that's how I found out. I mean, I, 
I found out the 25th that they suspected that it was going to because the people were coming from three forts. After the dam broke, where did you go for safety? Well, I was over at the Mommy and Daddy's. What? After it broke. Yeah, after it broke. <clears throat> where did we go for safety? Huh? Where did we go for safety? Gene Cook's. Oh, yeah, we went over to Gene because it was so cold. She had a big fire in the fireplace, and we went over to her house. What did snow on the ground. Yes, school snow, yeah. What did you lose during the flood? Well, we lo oh we lost we lived uh, down from the school in a mobile home. And we lost the underpinning of our mobile home. And we lost uh Mama Dog had had pups was under our house. I don't forget how many. But we lost the puppies. Where did you stay during the cleanup of the flood? We stayed in our home over at the where we lived. It was it was across the road from my mother and daddy's. Could you tell me what you sang during the cleanup? Many a night in the water. Huh? The many a nights in the water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said many times, I wish I was young enough to spend a whole year with those folks because they came in here and it was just, it was just wonderful to watch them. <laughs> how they worked. And it was just, uh, they were just wonderful people. Does this tragedy still have an effect on you today? I have to. I have to say, it's not a, I don't think a bad effect on me. I think if, if I had to do it over, because in 63, that water came out because I had, to, I had Jack, and we went, and if it had all come out, now it did come out some, and I was in it, I lost my shoes, I running, and I took my kids across the road, across the railroad, down a ditch, and up to the main road, and over to the hill, now that's how far I had to go. I took them and I went on the hill. Do you ever imagine that there could ever be a tragedy on Buffalo Creek comparable to the flood again? I don't think so. What I wanted to say before, the last time, the last thing was asked, I think in one respect it had a, a, a positive effect on me. Because I determined in my heart that if anything ever started like that again, because this dam had a start, it had a beginning, and people said, and they would say to me when I took that petition around, I'm afraid they'll put so much pressure on my husband that he'll finally be fired. If I sign this petition, to make them go and re do the right thing, the right way, and get that water out of there. Because there was a man came from Charleston after that dam broke, and he said, no, it was before, because he went, Bill Woodrum took him back on the hill to look where the dam was. Now that, the third dam was added after that, after 63. That man told Bill Woodrum, he said, now this is a remark he made. I don't care if they had to take, a, take that water out. In teaspoons, that water has to go. 
That's when we started with the petition. And people would not sign it. To get that started, to make them move that water. And I determined right to, uh, after the flood that if that ever happened again, I would, I don't want to, how I would do it, but somewhere or another, I would help that man that wanted it moved out of the, off of the creek. He wanted to move, but he didn't have the help and the backing. And the last one is for you, Paul. So it was said that you never thought the dam would break. Why did you believe that? Because the day before I was on it. When it did break, what was going through your mind? Run. <laughs> well, thank you guys for your time. Tell my name. Yeah. Okay. My name is Marie Kaysen, and my husband's name is Leon, and we lived at Lake Trobe across from the Boy Scout camp. I could look up the creek and see Andrew Johnson's house and the swimming pool. The, that morning would be and was my last view of this scene. What I remember about the Buffalo Creek Flood of 1972, it had rained hard all night. I was up early because I was going to Huntington, Marshall University. Uh, the evening before, I had purchased a TV for my daughter, and it was sort of early, around 7. My son Michael had gotten up and was wanting to play with the TV, so I made him go back to bed. I decided to go back also. Dozing off, I heard a knock at my door. My husband got up and answered it. A small, childlike voice said to him, they said the dam had broke, and she went back to a car to get in a car that was waiting for her. My husband quickly called Junior Leon, who's 12 years old, and he ran out to our garage and backed out our Tempest and as he backed out and away from the garage, it collapsed. My husband had moved our truck outside the yard. In the meantime, I jumped out of bed and looked up the creek. I saw a house moving down the creek. It had not reached the Scout Camp Bridge yet. And I ran to Cindy's room and grabbed a coat in the closet and, grabbed, and she grabbed her dog, Missy. She and I and Michael ran out to the car and got in. Junior Leon was already there, waiting in the car. My husband was in the truck behind us. As he drove out, the water was on his back bumper. Passing the Sites house, they were running toward the road and they had to go on across the railroad tracks. The Ramies were on their porch, and later we learned they did not make it. As we drove down the road, we could see objects spinning in the water. We were driving pretty fast. And when we got to Robinette, I stopped at my sister's house to warn them, and she gave me a pair of her husband's house slippers. Later, we met at the Robinette Church of God. As the water moved, and gaining speed, the houses in Robinette looked like they were bumping into one another. And then the railroad crossing exploded. The rails just popped up and curled up. And then we saw a trailer with a family in it going by. We could see someone at the windows, but what could we do? We were helpless. I do not want to ever forget the little girl who risked her life to warn us her name was Dreama Bragg, daughter of Margaret and Valentine Bragg. I think she was about four years old. The next day we went back to our home and it was still standing but flooded. The other three houses below us, the Bragg sites and the Ramies, were completely washed away. It was so, or I was so numb and spaced out, I took nothing from the house. It was as though I was in a trance. 
I was seeing all this, but I was not believing it. And that's what I remember. And I do not want to forget uh, about Dreama, Dreama Bragg, that little girl came over and told us because uh, her mother had put her in the car and she looked around, she was gone. And she said, she, Margaret told me later, she said, I looked up and, and seen her coming from your house. And she had come over and told us that I think that's what in the minutes and their 10, 15, 10, 20 minutes is what saved us. Or we would have been in the same position as the Ramies because, you know, our house would have been up above them. But I do believe that that, that, was, that was what, um, that warning, you know. But they said they were cars that went up and down the road blowing their horns, but I don't remember, remember that, if there were. <laughs> I would have, you know, it would have, I would have got, paid more attention, but now, but that was the warning that we got. Someone had called them and told them that, you know, that that dam had broke, and they were getting ready to leave, but the little girl came to my house. I would dream of brag. So I don't know if any other people remembers as much, but it's vivid and you won't forget it ever, ever. Got up, I looked out my window, my bedroom window go, looked straight up the creek, and uh, there's that big house, you know, coming up. Oh, that's when we really had to move. We had to get out of there. And I thank God He spared us, He had reasons despair us, you know, raise our children, our family. And I think he's been so good to me. <laughs> so good to me. You know, just uh, one thing after another. We were standing up on that hill and that trailer went by with those people in it. I can't, I cannot think of their names. I don't know if it's Gullet, Gullet's or not. Gullet, I'm not sure what his name was, but I know that the, the, the girl was in Elkins had married him. They, I think they had two children. That was so sad. But life and experiences and things, you know, people have survived. But we can't forget when something like that happens, it can happen again. If the, you know, the government doesn't um, take care of knowing where all these, these mines are, whatever, any kind of water, doesn't matter, that can dam up and, and break loose. Because it's a threat. You know, I'm thankful. Mm -hmm. Thankful that the little girl was there. She's grown now, though, Dreama. I think she lives in Beckley somewhere. Yeah. Over in Beckley. Her mother, her mother passed away, Margaret. Good afternoon, boys and girls. My name is Gertie Moore, grandmother of Courtney Adams, Jason Michael Rowe, and an ex-bus driver of this school for 29 years and a lifelong resident of Buffalo Creek. I'm 72 years old and I've lived two lives, one before the Buffalo Creek flood, 72. I lived 32 years of that life, and in that life I grew up with the others that lived and with those that lost their lives that day. As each of us went to bed that night, like any other time, expecting to wake up the same as all the other days before, only we didn't have any idea what was in store, that was never to be the same. Our security blanket, as I like to call it, was taken away. 
through the neglect of Pittston Coal Company, a 25 to 30 foot wall of black muck and coal dust was unleashed upon the unsuspecting and sleeping families that occupied 17 communities on Buffalo Creek. Men, women, children, mothers, fathers, family members, and babies met their untimely death. Try to imagine, if you can, sleeping comfortably in your beds, dreaming sweet dreams as you do now, to be awakened by noise that you can't identify, screaming from those who are trying to save themselves, and yes, this, so they could save their loved ones, only to have the cold black water or a piece of debris to savagely jerk your children. Knowing no one can hear you or cannot get to you and your loved ones from trying to save themselves and their own. Yes, we went to bed with one lie and woke up with another. I was blessed to have known about 80% of the people that lost their lives. If I could see a car, I would know who was driving it. If I needed to call someone from memory, I knew most of the phone numbers. Our community and church members were our families. That day I felt like an orphan. Though I never lost any blood family, my husband, Tom Sr., lost 23 members of his family. The first day of the rest of my life was spent trying to help and make sense of what had happened that day. Our inner strength came through. God was our refuge and our haven. One day at a time, we all pulled together, determined not to let this uh, tear us apart. We are strong, resilient, and depended on God and each other for our survival. We had to learn a whole new set of cars, friends, and phone numbers. The coal company said it was an act of God. It was not God's will for that to happen. Man built that dam. It truly was the will of man, love, and greed of money. It's been 41 years since that terrible day, and when I think or talk of my life before, my heart is still in pain. The day I'll forget is when they lay me to rest. Run down high side of a hill that big old storm washed us away my mama cried my mama she prayed but the rain kept coming anyway My daddy was a hard-working man By then the mines had crippled his hands On a welfare line With four children to feed If that big old storm just washed us away and the rain fell hard And the dams all broke And a surge of muddy water Came on crashing through Ellie lost her daughter Eighty lost a son In the mighty flood of 72 Pittston men said that dam would hold, but the Pittston men would 
just protecting their gold. Laredo and Christ, Saunders couldn't be saved. All of Buffalo Creek, under the waves. And the rain fell hard, and the dams all broke, and a surge of muddy water it came on crashing through. Ellen lost a daughter, Katie lost a son. Mining flood of '72, and underneath the rushing water, people went to early graves. In the mining flood of '72. The Buffalo Creek disaster happened in 1972 on February 26th. A coal mining dam broke loose. It was a wave of water like you'd see in a tsunami. Come down through the valley right up through there. And it came down through it, it just, it pushed and destroyed everything in its path. The world we knew was gone in a matter of minutes. The moment that my uh, mother decided that she knew that she wasn't going to be able to make it and that she had to throw me to the mountainside. I, I just can't even imagine what that moment had been. It had to have been in such a, a split second and to do it, it almost had to be instinctual to know that you're not going to make it. I did have some uh, physical scars, which were the leg was basically torn off because I was so young and thank God, uh, luckily I, I don't have any of those memories. Well, the Miracle Baby more or less represents us, the flood that happened. Harry is a very fortunate young man to be here with us, and um, I don't think he'll ever, ever not be in the minds when someone speaks of that, of the flood. And um, he's always been a fine young man. The way that I would uh, describe my dad is perfect. So after my... Uh, mother had passed, he was telling me stories about how he had to learn how to cook, how he had to learn how to clean, how to sew. And my favorite comment that he always made to me, he said, I even had to learn how to rock you to sleep at night. So this was not just a process, it, it was a huge process for him because it was totally out of his realm. So for him to be able to pick up that task of mother and father and to do it as, as well as he did, it, it was very impressive and very thankful for it. One of the things that uh, I, I really love about Buffalo Creek is just simply how natural it is here and just how breathtaking and beautiful. I mean, kid couldn't ask for a, a, a better place to run around and play. And specifically, uh, I mean, you can see this area right here. I mean, this was my childhood. I uh, hung out in this creek constantly. As you can see, this is, uh, this is definitely my spot. Be unbroken by and by, by and by, in a better home awaiting in the sky. In